idea about how much action Alacrity saw in the South Atlantic. This 4.5 inch gun fired something close to 500 rounds. And one of the reasons that Alacrity is coming home is that she has to have this gun barrel replaced. In all the action, Alacrity only suffered a scraped bow when she nosed in to rescue 74 men from the Atlantic conveyor. But she came very close to disaster. We were on the gun line off Stanley and uh, three Mirages appeared and came in over the three ships. Straff the Arrow, which I think you, you may have heard about, injured the first casualty of the war, one young seaman, and plonked two bombs very neatly on either side of the flight deck, uh, splashing the flight deck. And they went off in the wake, much to my relief and to the relief of those that were sitting at the back end of the ship. How close did they come to you? The, uh, the water from the splash impact uh, soaked the flight deck. The frigate wanted revenge for herself and for her sister ship, Antelope. On her exocets, the names of Argentine ships she was seeking. They were never fired. Plymouth has seen many a ship return safely and with honour, but that did not diminish the pride it felt today as alacrity slipped into her berth. Mothers, fathers, wives, sweethearts, and just the plain glad crowded the dockside. What do you think of the welcome? What can one say? Breathtaking, absolutely breathtaking from start to finish. Wonderful. <laughs> and for one young petty officer, there was a special reason to return safely, a daughter he'd never seen. The Prime Minister is to see the Labour Party leader, Mr Michael Foote, tomorrow to discuss the terms and membership of the inquiry which the government has undertaken to hold into the handling of the Falklands crisis. Mrs Thatcher clashed with Labour leaders again at question time in the Commons this afternoon. The former Labour Prime Minister, Mr Callaghan, asserted that whatever form the inquiry might take, the ultimate responsibility for events rested with Mrs Thatcher. And he suggested she'd made the greatest error of judgement in not taking action to prevent the Argentine invasion. The Right Honourable Gentleman is in a position to know of the many threats which over the years have been made from the Argentine. <laughs> And the latest ones had to be judged against the background of those which had been made previously. I am also very, I am also very happy to report to the Right Honourable Gentleman that the Argentines who landed on southern Thule during his time have now been removed. Mrs Thatcher now faces a major row at Westminster over the Falklands inquiry. Ministers acknowledge today that it's proving politically difficult and the Prime Minister's meeting with Michael Foote and Dennis Healy tomorrow promises to be a frosty one. It's a multi-dimensional dispute which, if she mishandles it, could take the political gloss of Mrs Thatcher's military triumph. She assured the House this afternoon that she wanted every single piece of evidence before the inquiry and didn't want to hide anything. But she's got two separate quarrels on her hands. One is with Labour, which wants the inquiry to concentrate on what it, what it sees as the key issue, how ministers came to be caught unprepared by the Argentine invasion. The Prime Minister believes this can only be done satisfactorily against a longer perspective, 17 years to be precise, of the Falklands policies of successive governments. She regards that as non-negotiable. The Liberals and Social Democrats have a different disagreement with the government, though Mr Steele is also suspicious about Mrs Thatcher's role. But he and his allies are more suspicious about the membership of the inquiry. The government wants to keep the numbers small, one Privy Councillor each from the Conservative and Labour parties and an academic. The names of various historians are being bruited around. The Alliance thinks it must be represented, either by Joe Grimmond or William Rogers. The Prime Minister is not disposed to take criticism lying down, as she showed when Mr Foote challenged her. All the signs were there. Can she tell us why she neglected those signs? Uh, uh, Mr Speaker, judging from what the Right Honourable Gentleman has said throughout the Falklands affair, and judging from what some of his honourable friends have said, the fact is that a Labour government was never fired a shot. Yeah. 
Although the Conservative Party erupted in anger at the time of the Argentine invasion, it's also angry at what it sees as opposition attempts to make political capital against the Prime Minister. But there's growing anger on the opposition side too. One Labour frontbencher thought the Prime Minister is showing insufficient humility for past failure, and he added, if humility has to be imposed, it's not an agreeable prospect. After Mr. Callaghan's Commons intervention, I asked him what kind of inquiry he wanted. I think it needs to be an immediate inquiry, and I think anybody inquiring into, into it ought to be free to see the Cabinet minutes, should be free to see the minutes of the Defence Committee, should be free to see the intelligence assessments, should be free to see the material on which those assessments are based, which is extremely important, and should be free, of course, to see the reports that were coming in from the embassy, which are much more open. Some of this is very secret material, but I think it all ought to be open to anybody who's investigating it. You see, I think the real question is, was there a serious misjudgment? Now, the result shows that there must have been a serious misjudgment. There was an invasion, the first one for many years. And I think that is the question that they ought really to look, look into. How we will come out of it, nobody knows. But I think if we were to start from that point, this would satisfy a great many people. Because remember, we've lost many lives and it's cost us a great deal as a result of what might have been a serious misjudgment. By whom? By the Prime Minister at the end. She must carry the final responsibility. Now, ultimately, the government has the votes in the Commons to set up whatever kind of inquiry it wants. But clearly, Mrs Thatcher would prefer to carry the opposition with her. In particular, she'll want to avoid a bruising debate in Parliament, perhaps even a censure motion, which is what's being talked about privately. From Buenos Aires comes a report that the original Argentine plan was to invade the Falklands this month or next. But our correspondent says General Galtieri seized the opportunity when the dispute broke out over the landing of scrap metal merchants on South Georgia and launched the invasion early. General Galtieri, according to military sources in Buenos Aires, later admitted he'd miscalculated the reaction to his Falklands policy. But the outgoing foreign minister who promoted that policy, Mr Costa Mendes, said again today that Argentina would never give up its claim to sovereignty. A national rail strike from midnight on Sunday, called by the main rail union, the NUR, is looking more likely tonight. This follows a meeting of the NUR executive, and despite talks still going on now at the conciliation service ACAS. And in the separate dispute in the London Underground, the NUR has called out its members from midnight. So the Underground now shuts down completely. With details of both disputes, our industrial correspondent Ian Ross. There's a feeling tonight at British Rail Headquarters that a national rail strike cannot now be averted, that the exploratory discussions at ACAS with both management and the railway unions won't get very far, and that instead efforts should be made to encourage railwomen to turn up for work on Monday in defiance of the strike call. There was the PR chairman's letter to all staff this morning saying, if you decide not to strike, we won't, despite the closed shop, dismiss you because you lose your union card. And then tonight, BR has posted special notices at stations saying it will attempt to run services with any staff reporting for duty, even though management must know that is largely wishful thinking. At the same time, it warns that if the strike isn't called off, the railway system will be progressively shut down from as early as 2 o'clock on Sunday afternoon. The reason for the strike? BR's payoff are tying a post-dated pay increase tightly to agreement on productivity changes. A 5% increase from September for six months, not backdated to April, provided negotiations on all of six productivity items are completed by the end of July. Everyone knows a long rail strike will cripple an already battered industry, but it seems that the BR board will be the last to give ground, fortified in their determined stand by a government breathing down Sir Peter Parker's neck. Sidney Wheel, the leader of the NUR, himself unhappy about the strike, dismisses talk that some of his members won't obey the strike call. I know they're not happy about it, because they're as, they're as con concerned about their job as I am. But I am saying to them this, if you don't defend this union and stand by it, which after all is the only defence you've got, if you abandon the union you are lost, and I'm appealing to their loyalty. It's going to be difficult, it's going to be rough, I know. But if we don't fight now, there'll be nothing left to fight about next year. That's how important it is. And you know that after a long strike, the industry won't be the same again? I know there'll be casualties. But it may well be, have you considered, 
that this government will be forced, as a consequence of public opinion, to reconsider their attitude to railways. We've just one or two days left now before the strike's due to begin. Strike on, strike off. On, I think. It looks more and more like it tonight, and government won't come to the rescue. As someone in the industry told me tonight, Mrs Thatcher, who has seen off President Galtieri, won't flinch at sorting out the railways. Well, the dispute on the London Underground over cuts and services, which has almost shut down the system in the last few days, took an odd twist tonight, which will shut it down completely. Aslev called off its strike of tube drivers and told them to return to work on the basis of a compromised formula from London Transport. But the NUR called all its underground members out. And as NUR members control the key jobs, the system can't operate. The health service unions have decided to step up their action in support of their 12% pay claim. Instead of the present series of one-day strikes, they'll hold a three-day national strike starting July the 19th. And they're asking other unions to walk out in sympathy with them. But emergency cover will be maintained. The Royal College of Nursing has decided to go back to the negotiating table to discuss the government's pay offer of 7.5%. They say they're unhappy with the offer. They were seeking 12%. The first meeting today between the new leaders of the mine workers and the coal board lasted only three and a half minutes. Union President Arthur Scargill walked out on the coal board chairman Norman Siddle. The meeting had begun in chaos when several hundred miners protesting about planned pit closures got into the coal board offices. They left after an appeal from Mr Scargill who then walked out himself a few minutes later. He said the day of behind the door negotiations is over. Mr. Scargill said the coal board had refused to give him details about possible pit closures. So he said there'd been no point in continuing the meeting. The union will now consider, at its conference in ten days' time, whether to take industrial action. The coal board said the union had demanded a list of pits proposed for closure or in danger of it, but no such list existed. Martin Aidney asked the coal board chairman if both sides might be looking for a confrontation. Well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't like to say that. I would hope it wasn't true, because uh, we're both new in a job, although we've both been in the industry a long time. And I would hope and I would sincerely believe that he has the fortunes of this industry at heart, and so have I. Uh, we may have a different approach about uh, how we're going to get there, but we can only resolve differences by talking to one another. And the one thing that frightens me more than anything, that it, is if we have this public argument and confrontation all the time that we shall lose a lot of our customers and a lot of our potential customers because if they're going to invest money in converting from oil or gas to coal either under the government scheme or under their own economic assessment they're certainly not going to do that if there's any doubt about the continuity of supply the Prime Minister criticised Mr Scargill's walkout when she spoke during question time in the Commons. She told MPs to walk out after only three and a half minutes is, to put it mildly, hardly constructive. Britain's biggest manhunt since the Yorkshire Ripper was tonight concentrated on forest land near Scarborough in Yorkshire. There are reports that the man wanted for two killings has fired shots at a police dog handler in Dolby Forest. Detectives had warned people in the area to lock their doors. Earlier, police confirmed they're linking the killing in Harrogate last week of Police Constable David Haig with the murder of a 52-year-old man in Nottinghamshire yesterday. This morning, detectives reconstructed Constable Haig's murder. Ken Cooper reporting. In the early morning mist, a panda car like that, driven by PC Haig, followed the route he took on his last patrol. His body was found here, at a well-known picnic spot near Harrogate. He'd been shot in the head at close range with a .22 calibre bullet. He died instantly, a few feet from the car. Today, a week later, his colleagues were out in force, questioning drivers passing the murder scene. 300 in all. Meanwhile, at Girton, near Newark, 150 policemen and a helicopter are searching the area around the home of Mr George Luckett and his wife Sylvia. He'd been tied up and shot dead. She was seriously wounded. Both had been shot in the head with the same gun that killed PC Haig. So what kind of man is the killer? Well, I don't know what kind of a man shoots a policeman, what kind of a man shoots uh, a man and his wife. Um, I'm no expert on this, but certainly a dangerous man, an extremely dangerous man, who's prepared to kill. If you had a chance to give a message to him, what would you say? Well, there's only one message I can give. He's, uh, he's committed murder twice. He's shot another woman. Uh, 
he can only get in touch with the police. Uh, before it comes to a confrontation, which could end up as a bloody confrontation, and uh, we don't want any more lives losing, not even if, at this stage. This is the first photo fit picture police have revealed of the killer, and they say on no account have a go. Well, now it seems that confrontation is taking place. The man appears to have set fire to the Brown Rover car he stole from his last victim, and now it seems he's taken a police dog van and disappeared into the depths of the forest. A police dog handler and a group of forestry workers have been fired on. The policeman's been treated for a minor arm injury. Detectives have warned local people to keep their doors locked. A helicopter has now been called in to help the search, which has now been going on for more than three hours. But the forest is very large, and the hunt for an armed and desperate man in the gathering darkness will need to be very very carefully handled. It's been another day of heavy fighting in Lebanon, with the battle between Israel and the Syrians becoming, if anything, even fiercer. Tonight, the Israelis claim to have captured the strategic town of Bamdoun on the main Beirut to Damascus road. Earlier, they shot down two Syrian MiG planes in the mountains south of this road. The Israelis have also been continuing their bombardment of the Palestinians still trapped in West Beirut. Bill Hamilton reporting. Israel has insisted she doesn't want to fight the Syrians, but with two ceasefires broken in the past fortnight, the artillery exchanges are becoming heavier and more frequent. Along a 14-mile front east of Beirut and straddling the important Damascus Highway, the deafening sound of tank, mortar and artillery fire has underlined the scale of the conflict. Today, the Israelis downed two Syrian MiG fighters in the first aerial battles for nearly a fortnight. There have been many casualties. The Israeli government has always felt that a successful military operation would strengthen its hand in any future negotiations over Lebanon. So, while the conflict goes on, the political battle too is now well underway. The Israeli cabinet met today, but left tight-lipped over any plans for ending their Operation Peace for Galilee. They were also assessing Mr. Begin's talks with President Reagan and the American position on the crisis. In Jerusalem, police were called to an anti-war demonstration in the center of the capital. About 150 women protesting at Israel's actions in Lebanon were heckled repeatedly by irate passers-by. Meanwhile, in a tunnel stretching 400 yards under a South Lebanese hillside, the Israeli army have come up with their biggest arms fine so far. The Israelis found crates containing every conceivable form of ammunition and weapons, much of which the PLO obtained from Libya, the Soviet Union and Iraq. They say it'll take 500 lorries to transport it all back to Israel. A big operation has begun to evacuate British, American and other foreign nationals from Lebanon. The British are being ferried to Cyprus on the container ship Royal Prince. Britain and other Western countries are becoming increasingly concerned about the fighting. Here with the background to the war in the Lebanon is our diplomatic correspondent, Keith Graves. Israel's attack on the Palestine Liberation Organization in southern Lebanon was brilliantly timed. After months of warnings that it would happen, the Israelis finally moved in at a time when other Arab states were otherwise occupied and when the Soviet Union, who usually used diplomatic muscle to save the Arabs, were busy trying to push disarmament. And most important of all, when the United States was worrying about the Falklands dispute, and when President Reagan and Secretary of State Haig were in Europe, and, as was clearly demonstrated, not really in touch with what was happening elsewhere. It was, said the Israelis, as they moved into southern Lebanon on June the 6th, an operation designed to create a cordon sanitaire, an area cleared of Palestinian Liberation Organization fighters who had consistently rocketed and shelled Israeli settlements in Upper Galilee. The shooting of the Israeli ambassador in London two days earlier was given as the reason, but that was at best only an excuse. Even the Israelis could not have devised and executed an invasion on such a scale in 48 hours. And if that cordon sanitaire was the original aim, it was quickly abandoned as the Israelis swept north. For four years, Israel's northern border had been protected by so-called Haddad land, a buffer zone run by a renegade Lebanese Christian army major called Haddad under Israeli patronage. 
Between that and PLO-dominated Lebanese territory was a 6,500-strong multinational United Nations force. As the Israelis swept north, that proved to be a farce. Within days, the Israelis had reached Beirut and linked up with their Christian Lebanese allies, leaving the Palestinians in a shambles and the Syrian so-called peacekeeping force in Lebanon bewildered and useless. PLO strongholds around Beirut and in other towns in southern Lebanon were bombed and strafed and shelled and rocketed with a ferocity that's left an estimated 10,000 dead, 15,000 wounded and maybe half a million homeless. Around 6,000 of the original 20,000 fighting men of the PLO are still inside beleaguered Beirut and despite the talk of ceasefires and compromises there seems no chance of the Israelis letting them off the hook. Daily the Israelis are pouring in the equipment not for maintaining a siege but for breaking it and the Palestinians will be forced to fight because they like the Jews who fought to make Palestine their homeland 35 years ago and started this conflict have nowhere else to go. There are an estimated four million Palestinians dispersed around the world. Half a million of them live in Israel as Israeli citizens. Another million plus live unwillingly under Israeli occupation in the Gaza Strip and on the West Bank. Around Israel's borders live another million and a half. One million in Jordan where they make up a majority of the population but are largely loyal to King Hussein. About 150,000 in Syria where they're kept under a very tight reign in that unstable country and about half a million in Lebanon, where they'd virtually taken over half the country at gunpoint. Another 350,000 or so live around the Arabian Gulf, again under a tight reign and playing little part in the fight against Israel. The Palestinians have been abandoned by their brother Arabs. The years of brave words have, in the Palestinians' real hours of need, not been translated into deeds. The Gulf states have their own problems as Iran tries to spread the Islamic revolution to their autocratic regimes. Iraq has just lost a war with Iran. Syria has their own internal problems and is trying to keep out of Israel's way. And Jordan knows that at the first sign of a move against Israel, she would come under attack and be defeated. And anyway, none of the Arab states really wants a powerful Palestinian group in the Middle East. They've used the Palestinians as a stick to beat the Israelis. And so the Palestinians stand alone. But even if the Israelis do move into Beirut and rout them there, it will not solve the problem in the long term. It will only ensure that one day there'll be another generation steeped in hatred and prepared to die to give expression to that hatred. In Zimbabwe, the authorities are investigating an attack early this morning on the house of the Prime Minister, Mr. Robert Mugabe. He wasn't hurt in the attack, but some damage was done to his house in the capital, Harare, formerly Salisbury. Guards fired on the assailants, and later they found the body of a uniformed man. And Mr. Ian Smith, the former Prime Minister, collapsed during a meeting of the Zimbabwe Parliament this afternoon. He's now in hospital, where his condition is said to be satisfactory. A joint Soviet-French manned space flight was successfully launched this evening, taking two Soviet astronauts and one Frenchman into orbit. Jean-Luc Chrétien is the first West European to go into space, and for the first time the launch was shown live on television in Russia and in France. The mission was arranged as a prestige project by President Giscard d'Estaing. His left-wing successors have kept it going, but without much enthusiasm. They emphasize it's a purely scientific venture without political significance. The French astronaut said perhaps the hardest part of his training in the Soviet Union was learning Russian. He and his two Soviet colleagues on board the Soyuz 6 will dock tomorrow with the orbiting Salyut station where two other spacemen have been working for the last two months. The return to Earth is scheduled for July the 2nd. After the first major espionage trial in Britain for several years, two South Americans have been jailed for spying for Cuba. Luis Fernandez and Antonio Sanchez, who claim to be Mexicans, were both sent to prison for seven years after being found guilty of charges under the Official Secrets Act. They were arrested by immigration officers at Gatwick Airport. During the two-week trial, the prosecution said their role was to act as couriers. Their baggage contained equipment for sending coded wireless messages and forged documents. The judge said the evidence against the two men was truly overwhelming. 
It's no fault of yours, he told them, that you did not do serious damage to this country. Prince Charles has had his first official engagement since the birth of his son on Monday. He was opening a new laboratory unit at Beckenham in Kent, and although he arrived late, most of the 1,600 employees at the Wellcome Foundation had turned out to see him and to give him tips for looking after the still unnamed prince. I was also handed, as I drove in, through the window, uh, a collection of ominous-looking tubes <laughs> of ointments, I think called crapoline. <laughs> I may have got the name wrong, but I think it's... <laughs> and in the brief moment that I gl glimpsed uh, what it said. It has something to do with the nappy rash, as far as I can figure. And it uh, was obviously made by the Welcome Foundation. And uh, all I can say is, if the next time you could produce something which can deal with traffic rash, I'd be very grateful. The new baby's grandfather, Prince Philip, was met with shouts of, Grandad, Grandad, we love you, when he visited the Land Rover plant at Solihull in the West Midlands. But he didn't give any hints about a name for his new grandson, whom he hasn't yet had time to visit. And thank you also for your remarks about my grandson. It's a great relief and a great pleasure. And I know everybody's very delighted. And uh, if I ever get a chance, I'd be quite like to see it in due course. <laughs> The Queen, meanwhile, has been giving athlete Brendan Foster a send-off from Buckingham Palace on the first leg of the traditional Commonwealth Games relay. This year, the baton containing the Queen's message to the Commonwealth has got further to go than usual, about 18,000 miles to Brisbane, Australia. It's being flown from Heathrow to Perth, but will still pass through more than 3,000 pairs of hands before arriving in time for the opening ceremony in September. England's cricketers have made a good start in the second Cornhill test against India at Old Trafford, although the middle-order batsmen failed to capitalise on a fine opening partnership by Jeff Cook and Chris Tavare. The two put on 106, but then England lost five quick wickets before rallying. At the close, they were 239 for five, with Ian Botham hitting his 11th test 50. Michael Blakey watched the first day's play. The Indian slip fields had dropped Cook and Tavare, but Alan Lamb wasn't so lucky. After the splendid start, two wickets had gone for 11 runs. David Gower had looked in the moot for another attractive innings. But the catches were beginning to stick, and England had lost three wickets for 141. Ian Botham's innings at Old Trafford last year defeated and demoralised Australia. He wasted no time today in dishing out similar treatment against the Indians. In one over, he thrashed Madden Lau for 12 runs. Once again, he turned the course of the game. of the day. had taken nearly four hours to score 50. The sight of Ian Botham may have unnerved him. And Doshi stepped in with another wicket in the same over. Randall gone without scoring and half the side out for 161. But Botham stopped the rot. So Botham bringing the 200 up and taking himself on to 46. We'll have a little bit more for my 50, he says, and that's short again. And crack through the offside. Another glorious 50 here to Ian Botham. It's come off only 46 balls, 10 fours in it. It's 11th Test 50, and is six against India. And he was still there at the close with 60 not out, and Miller as his partner. What a player. In Spain, the preliminary group matches in the World Cup are almost completed. The last three are tomorrow. 
There were two matches this afternoon. In Group 2, Algeria beat Chile 3-2, a win which means West Germany must now beat Austria to go through. And in Group 4, France's draw with Czechoslovakia means they'll qualify unless England lose to Kuwait tomorrow. Meanwhile, England's captain, Kevin Keegan, is reported to have spent two days back at his former club, Hamburg, in an effort to clear up his back injury. He's expected to rejoin the England squad tomorrow. Scotland's World Cup footballers have arrived back home still disappointed by just missing qualification for the second round matches. They were eliminated on goal difference by the Soviet Union and it's the third successive World Cup in which the Scots have missed out in this way. But there was at least some consolation for their loyal army of supporters. The Scottish Football Association says it's so impressed with the impeccable behaviour of the fans out in Spain that they've decided to reduce the admission prices for the next international at Camden Park. Or Hampton Park, as they call it. Wimbledon had its first rain-free day this week, and those who turned up enjoyed both the sunshine and some fine play. All the remaining men's seeds are safely through to the next round, but the ladies' number 16 seed, former champion Yvonne Corley, fell at the first hurdle. She lost in a straight set to Zena Garrison of the United States. Another former champion, Jimmy Connors, began impressively facing Australian John Alexander on the centre court. But after winning the first set easily, Connors was taken to a tie-break in the fourth set, with Alexander fighting for every point. Oh, well reacted. But it couldn't last for Alexander. Connors leading 8-7 in the tie-break and at match point. So, Connors through to the next round, winning 6-3, 4-6, 6-1, 7-6. And finally, tonight's main stories again. A national rail strike seems certain to begin next Monday. In Yorkshire, a suspected double murderer fired at the police again tonight. He stole a dog handler's van and is being chased. In Lebanon, the fighting between the Israelis and the Syrians is getting more serious. Mrs Thatcher clashed in the Commons today with Labour leaders over her government's handling of the Falklands. Former Prime Minister James Callaghan told her she'd made the gravest error of judgment in not taking action to stop the Argentine invasion. Well, I'll be back at 11 o'clock tonight on BBC One with the late headlines. Tomorrow we hope to have first pictures of the advance on Stanley, the moment when British troops heard the Argentines had surrendered, and pictures too of the triumphant return to the capital. If we get those pictures, we'll be on the air with a special news report at ten past ten tomorrow morning on BBC One, and there'll be full coverage in all our bulletins. But tonight, we leave you with the pictures that have made the news. The attack on Sir Galahad, the injured, and the heroism of the men who rescued them. Let's go, let's go.